My name is Kenji Price, and I'm the United States Attorney for the District of Hawaii. To my left is Special Agent in Charge of the IRS Seattle Field Office, Justin Campbell. To his left is Assistant United States Attorney Michael Albanese of the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Hawaii, and to his left is the Attorney General of the State of Hawaii, Claire Connors. Today I'm announcing federal charges against three individuals related to a labor union in Hawaii and other recent developments in my office's efforts to hold union officials accountable for their crimes. Yesterday, a federal grand jury in the District of Hawaii returned a 70-count indictment against Brian Ahakuelo, Marilyn Ahakuelo, and Jennifer Estencion, also known as Jennifer Rivera. The indictment charges a conspiracy perpetrated by these three individuals to defraud members of an electrical workers union and other related crimes. But before I discuss the specifics of these charges, I'll provide you with a few background facts, all of which are alleged in the indictment. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, or the IBEW, is an electrical workers union in the United States and Canada. Local 1260, which represents approximately 3,000 members, is the Hawaii-based component of the IBEW. During the time period relevant to this indictment, Local 1260's members were divided into nine units located in Guam and Hawaii. Defendant Brian Ahakuelo served as business manager and financial secretary for Local 1260 from June of 2011 to May of 2016. In this capacity, he was responsible for managing the day-to-day -day operations of Local 1260. He had the power to appoint assistants, representatives, and clerical employees, all of whom worked under his direction and could be removed by him at any time. Defendant Marilyn Ahakuelo is Brian Ahakuelo's wife, and defender, Defendant Jennifer Estencion is Marilyn Ahakuelo's sister. Count one of the indictment charges all three of these defendants with criminal conspiracy. In the conspiracy, the defendants siphoned thousands of dollars from local 1260s coffers and then tried to replenish the funds by raising union dues through a rigged election. The defendants also conspired to embezzle union funds by spending union funds on personal expenses with no legitimate purpose. The allegations are as follows. Defendant Brian Ahakuelo used his authority as business manager and financial secretary to fill vacancies on local 1260's executive board with folks who had no experience or were loyal to him. By doing this, he gained complete control of local 1260's finances and abused that power to benefit himself and his family members. He got jobs for his wife and her sister and assigned himself and the two of them official credit cards. Importantly, he also gave defendant Estencion the job of reviewing and approving credit card purchases that he and his wife made with their official credit cards. As discussed in more detail below, some of those purchases had absolutely no legitimate business purpose. Then, after running local 1260's $700,000 budget surplus down to a $700,000 deficit, defendant Brian Ahakuelo proposed a resolution to raise union dues by around 100%. When he didn't have the votes to get the resolution passed, he and his two co-defendants rigged a union vote to change the result. In particular, they falsified minutes and sign-in sheets from a membership meeting and prepared fake ballots indicating that members voted in favor of the resolution when they actually did not. As a result of the defendant's criminal conspiracy, the resolution passed and union members paid $3.7 million in dues that they never should have paid. And I'd like to direct your attention briefly to the board to my right, which captures the essence of a, a big portion of this conspiracy. If you look at the bottom left-hand corner of this board, you can see Local 1260 General Fund. In 2010, there was a surplus of over, uh, excuse me, of $700,000. As you know, Brian Ahakuelo took over union affairs in 2011. By 2014, you have a net deficit of over $700,000. Fast forward to January 2015. You have the proposal of resolution number 14-07 a resolution to increase membership dues. You know from my remarks, the defendants falsified results of the vote to ensure that that resolution passed. 
Then I want to direct your attention to the bottom right-hand side of this board where it says the results of the rigged election. Essentially, as a result of that rig rigged election, Local 1260 collected over 3.7 million in additional dues between March of 2015 and May of 2016. Counts two through 43 of the indictment charge all three defendants with wire fraud. The wire fraud consisted of essentially two components. The first is orchestrating the rigged election that I just described. The second is causing employers to collect the increased union dues and then electronically moving them into a bank account controlled by Local 1260. Counts 44 to 63 of the indictment charged defendant Brian Ahakwella with money laundering for directing the transfer of the proceeds of the wire fraud from Local 1260's electronic funds transfer account into its general operating fund, where the defendants used the money for non-official purposes. Counts 64 through 67 charged defendant Brian Ahakwello, defendant Marilyn Ahakwello, or both with using union funds for personal travel, including visits to Las Vegas, Nevada, and Virginia during the holiday season in 2014 and in 2015. Count 68 charges defendant Brian Ahakwello with embezzlement for using union funds to pay his son-in-law roughly $29,000 for doing little to no work for the union. Count 69 charges Brian Ahakwello with embezzlement for using approximately $24,500 of union funds to pay off the loan on his wife's Toyota Tacoma without obtaining the permission of Local 1260's board. Count 70 charges defendant Brian Ahakwello with embezzling union funds by using them to pay an approximately $597 restaurant bill for no union benefit. I'd like to direct your attention to the second board over here that essentially captures uh, much of the embezzlement allegations in this indictment. You can see in the upper left-hand corner, union funds were essentially expended for personal travel for Brian Ahakwello as well as Marilyn Ahakwello. You can see in the bottom left-hand corner that some union funds were spent for personal restaurant expenses for Brian Ahakwello. As discussed earlier, you can see funds were expended to hire family members at inflated salaries, namely defendant Ahakwello's son-in-law, excuse me, defendant Brian Ahakwello's son-in-law. And then you can also see in the bottom right-hand corner of the page, funds were expended for personal, for the personal vehicle, uh, Marin Ahakwello's Toyota Tacoma. Now four other individuals are charged today with conspiracy, to make or cause to be made false entries and records required to be kept by a labor union, a misdemeanor, as part of this investigation. Their names are Michael Britton, Daniel Rose, Leanne Miyamura, and Russell Yamanoha. It's important to note that these charges are merely accusation, and e accusations, and each of the in individuals I mentioned are innocent until they're proven guilty in a court of law. Now, unfortunately, this is not the only recent example of a union official violating the law by embezzling funds from union coffers or engaging in other criminal conduct. For example, just last month, Rodney Capello, former business manager and secretary treasurer of the Hawaii Electrical Workers Labor's Local Union 722, pleaded guilty to embezzling almost $184,000 in labor union funds. In perpetrating this, his criminal conduct, he also tried to cover it up by, among other things, falsifying union records and intentionally failing to seek approval from the executive board or union members to pay himself. In April of this year, Charles Kimo Brown, who served as Secretary Treasury of the Hawaii Longshore Division, was indicted by a grand jury in this district with falsifying union records and embezzling labor union funds. These prosecutions are disturbing examples of officials entrusted with the responsibility of managing organizations designed to protect workers, instead exploiting them by siphoning funds from union coffers to line their own pockets. As my office's prosecutions make clear, we will aggressively investigate and prosecute corrupt union officials who abuse the trust vested in them by the hardworking folks in our communities. My message to these officials is simple. If your job is to protect the hardworking men and women in our communities, then do that. If you use your position to corruptly line your own pockets or serve other corrupt interests, we're coming after you and will hold you accountable to the fullest extent of the law. Before introducing the next speaker, 
I want to say a few words about the work performed by this outstanding investigative team. Cases like this are incredibly time and resource intensive. I'd like to commend the work of all of the investigators who worked on this case, Assistant United States Attorney Mike Albanese, and the other folks who were not present, but also contributed substantially to our efforts in this case. These folks include the Department of Labor, Office of Labor Management Standards, and former Assistant United States Attorney Larry Tong. Both the Department of Labor investigators and Mr. Tong contributed significantly to this effort, and their work is very much the reason why we're here today. Now I want to introduce Special Agent in Charge of the IRS Seattle Field Office, Justin Campbell, who will share a few remarks. Good morning. My name is Justin Campbell. I'm the Special Agent in Charge at Internal Revenue Service Criminal Investigation. Our agency is most commonly associated with major tax crime investigations. However, because of the financial expertise of our investigators, we are often called upon to conduct major fraud investigations that are non-tax in nature. Our role in this case was simple, follow the money. What we found was, was an alleged network of corrupt power and greed. The charging document released yesterday detailed alleged acts that are deeply troubling because they directly impacted the paychecks of electrical workers in the Hawaiian Islands and Guam. I want to thank the partners on this investigation, the Department of Labor, Office of Labor Management Standards, and the Hawaii Department of the Attorney General, and of course, the United States Attorney's Office. Thank you. I now like to introduce the Attorney General of the State of Hawaii, Claire Connors. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. I just wanted to start by thanking the principals who are speaking here today for their leadership in this case. And I also would like to thank the agents and the line prosecutors who did an incredible amount of work as part of this investigation and who have brought us to the point we're here today now uh, announcing the public charges in this case. The collaborative efforts of the state and the federal agencies is a significant and signature aspect of this case. They have demonstrated that uh, this type of collaboration, this type of partnership, furthers all interests of the state and the government as a whole. In general, cases like this, complex cases, and in particular cases involving unions, they require multi-agency investigations. And I did many of them when I was here as part of this office, and I look forward to now, as a part of the Department of the Attorney General, continuing to work with our partners to ensure that it is very clear that the state is committed to investigating and to prosecuting persons who are in positions of trust and who engage in conduct that violates that trust. We look forward to continuing to work and collaborate with our federal partners in this case as the litigation proceeds to its next phase. Thank you very much. <laughs> 